clay that my words may not just be mine, that we all may be blessed by your Holy Spirit. We are in a ticklish time and season for your average clergy person who likes positions of great moral clarity that one can pontificate upon. Um, and many in Christian leadership uh, sometimes seem to be acting under the illusion that our lives are just a series of clear moral decisions. And once you've made that decision, you just float on on that trajectory uh, with no problems at all, you know? And if that is your opinion, then you can also make equally clear denunciations of people's behavior. Uh, and you can divide humanity up into classes of people who behave and who don't behave, and situations which are moral and awful, uh, and those situations which are good. And many people, uh, especially, uh, dare I say it, younger people, uh, have had the luxury of living in societies and times where they have that luxury of making uh, decisions about the nature of the world which remain unchallenged. Now to people of my parents' generation and grandparents' generation, uh, there was very little time in their lives where they were able to swim along in a time of peace and prosperity, believing themselves to be a non-violent person, a good Christian, a this or a that, without it being buffeted by events. And it is events which muddy the waters of human life uh, and force us to be the sort of people uh, that carry through uh, decisions instead of the sort of person that sits in a position of glorious isolation and decides on what is good and bad. What actually happens to most of us is we are faced with many, many conflicting claims upon us uh, and we do the best we can. I only discovered uh, last week that my great-grandfather was um, torpedoed uh, by a U-boat in 1918, and not long before the armistice in the Great War. And he was uh, a Swede with a wife and children who were living in England. Um, and he was seen trying to swim away from the boat, which was a merchantman, which I believe had a neutral registration, uh, but was never found again. He died at sea. Uh, he was registered, his death was registered at Limehouse. So that's the only thing I knew, because Limehouse is part of what was East London Docks. And I think about that man, whose life um, was buffeted by circumstance. He was born in great poverty in an island uh, in Stockholm Harbour, and his parents were fisher folk, and he became a seaman. And early in his life, he met a woman called Gertrude Blagg, uh, in the northeast of England, and he married her, and then he was called to go to sea at a time of war when boats were being blown out of the water, but also there was the added complication, which was annoying if you want to make a clear moral distinction between violence and non-violence, the added complication that there were Zeppelin raids up and down the east coast where his wife and children lived, and blasted great German battleships came and inconveniently bombard the towns on the east coast where his wife and his children lived. So I guess that Jack Olson had to make some difficult decisions. I also guess that my grandfather had difficult decisions to make when he ended up being in the RAF or when he served in Bomber Command. My Uncle Charlie probably had some very difficult, muddy, complex decisions to make uh, when he ended up uh, as a speedboat captain out of Malta during the Siege of Malta in the Second World <laughs> War, uh, plucking down Spitfire pilots out of the Mediterranean so that they could fight again later in the same day in order to defend the island. I no longer live in a place of moral clarity regarding these things. I used to believe I can, and then I realized that it was a luxury that had been bought for me by others. And I know this sounds an easy response that we always get. Oh, well, the freedom was given up so that we might have it, blah, 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 blah. But I came to a point in my life where I realized that that was exactly what had happened. That was exactly what had happened. That there were muddy, dark, obscure, violent, threatening times in human history where something more than a mere moral decision was required. At 
actions which put one at risk, great moral risk, of doing things which you wouldn't be able to shrug off, but which you felt in your heart were required. I think about my grandfather and my great-grandfather and my uncle and all those others who served, and I think about all those dear people who are still alive who served, and I think about uh, the moral equivalence that they had to go through, that they didn't have that luxury of absolute certainty that the world and God had ushered them into this particular path. But they had to live with the consequences, but they still did I think about Jimmy Boschka, who served in Vietnam, and I think about R.D. Gentry, who was a soldier for many, many years, and I think about all you dear people uh, who did things which I will never be called upon to do, ever be called upon to do, and I realized that this luxury was purchased for me. And therefore, on this strange day of commemoration, where it's a commemoration of a living primarily here in the United States, and a commemoration of the dead, primarily uh, in the other countries of the Commonwealth and the West. We can do both things, because both things are still alive amongst us, very much alive. We are a very uh, veteran rich community here at MCC of the Coachella Valley, and I, I would like to embarrass you if you feel able to do so, but, but if you are a veteran, if you've served, would you be willing to stand? <laughs> father who served in the military in the Second World War and during the early 50s. Well, we're told in the Book of Amos uh, that those of us who desire the day of the Lord had better be careful what we ask for. But what we ask for is not a place of light and clarity. What we're asking for when we ask for the day of the Lord, is the day of the Lord is not a continuance of our pleasant life in an ever more pleasant environment. It's not just more of the same with the irritation state. It is a place of darkness and confusion. It is a place where we will be asked to lay ourselves on the line in places and environments uh, which are not simple and clean, which are not like the altar call that you make as a teenager, which are not like the confession that you make when you're in church. The circumstances of human life in the society in which we live are frequently dark and obscure. And the decisions which we have to make in the light of that darkness and obscurity are leaps of faith. And they're not individual decisions, they are communal decisions. They are the decisions of family, of community, of nation, and in fact of the entire congregation of humanity. No matter how much we crave peace, pacifism, and the avoidance of violence, our ancestors and sometimes ourselves have been faithed with positions where the luxuries of that sort of moral clarity are not afforded to us. It's easy now with all these years between events to forget what the world must have looked like in 1939, to forget what it must have looked like from the American perspective in 1941, to forget what was happening in Europe and what is happening in places around the world now, and to forget that from our position of seeming invincibility in which we live now, ourselves and our ancestors and those friends and brothers and sisters of ours that were in Europe were not in that position of invincibility, where fighting did not seem like a luxury or an action of economic superiority, where Adolf Hitler and his armies were 22 miles across the English Channel. And therefore, those decisions have to be respected by following generations. And the people who made those decisions have to be prayed for and given our support and thanks. And we are denied those easy moral victories of denouncing all those things which upset us and aggravate us, that seem to be dark and muddied, that seem to speak of a day of the Lord 
which is not clarity and light, but is darkness and terror. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.